Hi listeners, stories have so much power and so does whoever controls the narrative. It is time that we dissect and analyze these stories. I am Vipul and this is Vogue Tales. Hi everyone, this week's episode comes a few days after Father's Day, so a big shout out to my dad and all the amazing dads out there. Hope you all had a fantastic day. And for today's story, I have Carl as our guest, who is a dad of a two-year-old. Hope you had a fun Father's Day, Carl, and welcome to the show. Thank you very much for the Father's Day wishes and for the invitation to be on the show. I'm really excited about it. I did get, when I picked up my son from daycare on Friday, he had a mysterious paper bag with my Father's Day gift in it, but I promised my wife that we would open it all together on Sunday, on the actual Father's Day. So I don't know what's in it, so I'm really excited about that. I know it's, you know, something that a two-year-old made at daycare, but it's exciting. <laughs> it's my first my first gift that he made for Father's Day, so. Yeah, oh my God, that's so exciting and precious. Also, I want to acknowledge that we are recording this episode and today is Saturday, so tomorrow is Father's Day, although this episode will come out on Wednesday, so it's going to be in the past. So by the time this episode comes out, Carl, you would have opened your present and uh, I'm sure it will be really cute, whatever he made. So do you have any plans for tomorrow, which is the technical Father's Day? None. Uh, my wife is visiting her parents right now, so it's just going to be me and the kiddo. We have nothing planned, but as anyone with a toddler might know, uh, we'll be doing whatever he wants to do all day. So. <laughs> That's true. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, you'll have a lot of time to spend together. Um, So growing up, did you celebrate Father's Day or was it not a big deal? We didn't, we made a, you know, slightly less of a big deal than a birthday or something. But we still, usually on both my father's birthday and on Father's Day, the big thing is that we would go to eat at an Indian restaurant because way back in the 70s, my dad went to India for a couple months and he really likes Indian food. So it was difficult to find in the 90s in rural Iowa, but there was an Indian place about, I don't know, half an hour drive away. So we would we'd go there for his birthday and for Father's Day. That's amazing. Oh my God. I love Indian food too. And <laughs> obviously. <laughs> um, so I'm glad that y'all made that trip for 30 minutes to find that restaurant and you found some good Indian food. And talking about Indian food, this story is from Northern India from the book Folk Tales of Kashmir and is titled All for a Pesa. Pesa is the lowest unit of Indian currency. So it's story time. There lived in a valley a very wealthy merchant who was not at all happy with his son. The boy showed no signs of intelligence or creativity, much less any willingness to work. His mother always thought the best of him, however, was constantly making excuses for him. When the boy reached the age to marry, his mother begged the merchant to seek a proper wife for him. The merchant, however, was too ashamed of his lazy son and in his own mind was fully decided never to have him married. But the mother had set her heart on this. It was the one thing that she had been looking forward to for years. To have her son remain a bachelor all his life would be unthinkable. She simply would not agree to this for a moment. And so she urged excuses for her son. She claimed to have now and again noticed extraordinary qualities of wisdom and intelligence in him. Her speaking in this way only annoyed the merchant. Look here, the merchant said to his wife one day, when she had been praising her son. I have heard this many times before, but you have never once proved it. I do not believe there is a particle of truth in anything that you say. Mothers are blind. However, to satisfy you, I will give the fool another chance. Send for him and give him this one small coin, this pesa. Tell him to go to the bazaar and with this one pesa to buy one item. 
that one item must be something to eat, something to drink, something to chew on, something to plant in the garden, and some food for the cow. The mother told the boy these instructions, gave him the pesa, and the boy left. When he came to the bazaar, he became alarmed and wondered, what can be bought for only one pesa? To eat and drink and do all the other things my mother asks for. Surely this is an impossible task. At that moment, the daughter of an ironsmith came up. Seeing his unhappy expression, she asked him what was the matter. He told everything his mother had ordered him to do so. I know what you can do, she said. So now, I'm going to give everyone 10 seconds to think of an answer to this riddle. Remember, one item, something to eat, something to drink, something to chew on, something you can plant in the garden, and some food for the cow. And the time starts now. Okay, time's up. So, Carl, did you come up with an answer? I was trying to figure this. No, I, I don't have a definite answer. So, <laughs> the I didn't know if the the clue giver was the daughter of an ironsmith. I don't know if a, if a blacksmith's daughter is is important to the story. If it's a meaningful clue, hmm. but yeah, the only thing I can think of. So, I mean, it could be like a bean or a lentil or a grain or some kind of a seed to plant, but that gets most of them because you can eat that and plant it and feed the cow with it and you could chew on it but something mm -hmm. to drink that's the the one that has me kind of stumped so right yeah the best i can come up with is some sort of a seed actually there are seeds involved and to give you the correct answer i will continue with the story the girl said go and buy a watermelon with one pesa it provides something to eat something to drink something to chew upon something to plant in the garden, and some food for the cow. Give it to your parents and they will be pleased. Uh, okay, yeah. I do remember when we were little, we would save the rinds from watermelons and other melons and take them to our neighbors who had goats to give them all to the goats. So Yeah, so, yeah. so you know, and I guess... Our like, animals you know... do love those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like watermelon too, especially like right now, it's summertime, so, you know, it's a great snack. Anyway, so this is exactly what the merchant's son did. He bought the watermelon and his mother, seeing the clever purchase, was very glad. She told the father about it, but the son admitted that the daughter of an ironsmith advised him to do so. Nevertheless, the father was impressed that he found such a fine solution. They invited the family of the ironsmith to their house for dinner and both parents agreed that the daughter of the ironsmith would marry the merchant's son. You know, like all <laughs> stories, there has mm -hmm. to be like a wedding. Um, but although the story goes on with ironsmith's daughter proving her cleverness at every step, we will stop the story here and get on with our discussion. So Carl, what are your initial thoughts on the story and what is your take on the difference between the mother and father's treatment towards the boy? Uh, the father... You know, he, he has the resources at his disposal being a very wealthy merchant, but mm -hmm. his son showing no willingness to work and being, quote, lazy, I feel like he played a part in enabling that kind of behavior in his son. So I think he's putting a lot of fault and culpability onto the son, and it's not necessarily the boy's fault. Maybe mm. he was never encouraged to work. And right. Yeah, the, the mother's treatment, I don't know, it's also not seeking to really solve the problem. It's more enabling of it where she's making excuses for him. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, even the daughter of the ironsmith, she's coming up with it. It is good that he was honest and did give her credit for the solution, but I, I, I couldn't solve the riddle. So maybe I lack the intelligence and creativity, <laughs> but uh, it does seem like both the parents are coming at parenting from different angles and both of those angles are possibly not the best. <laughs> right, yeah. So in situations where one parent is more of an enabler and one is a bit more strict, you know, just like a good cop and a bad cop, um, mm -hmm. which one are you or I guess will be when your son grows up? I'm already the permissive one and my wife is the one who is more uh, directive and corrective with <laughs> him, so... <laughs> Right. So I guess there's a balance there because you don't want <laughs> both parents to be super relaxed. Uh, 
or I don't know. I'm not a parent, so I can't comment on that. Yeah, but, well, it, you start with a lot of ideas in your head of what sorts of things you will allow and not allow. And then that all goes right out the window as soon as you have to start enacting those plans. It's one of those no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Hmm. So it goes from, <laughs> you know, no sticks inside the house to maybe just that one small stick and then clean <laughs> sticks and then just don't hit anything with the stick. <laughs> 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 right so i think it's a uh, it's, yeah you start with something and then slowly it gradually modifies into something else uh, whatever works um also like you know i think i probably should mention although you know in no way i am comparing the situation because you know it's totally different but <laughs> i'm just gonna add that um uh, so i have two cats and uh i'm the relaxed parent the enabler and the cats know how to play me so I'm go. definitely the the pushover, so he <laughs> he will. Yeah, our son, our son will come up to me and he'll say like, "Papa, sit over there." <laughs> huh? Oh, okay. And I'll start walking over there, and then I'll look at my wife, and she's just looking at me with this <laughs> look of disbelief, like, "Why are you just doing whatever a two year old tells you to do?" But, well, I mean, I didn't have any reason not to. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, kids are smart like that. Anyway, so talking under ancestral conditions, parenting was mostly done by mothers. While fathers took care of working outside, this probably made the kid closer to mothers. And I don't know if you've heard the phrase, mama's baby, papa's maybe. Just goes to show that kids can be more emotionally attached to the mother. And I think it is a social construct, putting different kinds of pressure on mothers and fathers, dividing the parental setup. And the whole patriarchy root cause of so many problems, suggesting fathers not to express their emotions, bottle up their feelings. And even now, not every workplace gives paternity leave. However, things are changing now. In a lot of cases, both parents are working, and now both are trying to be hands-on parents. But still, mothers and fathers have defined roles with stereotypical dad duties. Do you think gender norms can inhibit fathers from having an emotional bond with the kids? Definitely. So I grew up in a very Midwestern traditional situation where my dad was working full time and my mom was at home with us until we started going to school and then she went back to work. But yeah, it was very much a mom's at home and dad's at work kind of a situation. And that was the environment I grew up in. There's nothing wrong with it. But uh, the environment that my wife and my son and I are in is much more where she and I are both working, but she's faculty and I'm a student. So I have a lot less expectations on me so I can slack off a bit more at work and do a little bit more at home so I wouldn't say I'm a homemaker but I really have found a lot of fun and joy in doing things around the house and right when the pandemic started daycare was closed down so luckily both of our bosses were very understanding and said, you keep working as much as you can, but I understand that you have a toddler at home with. So it kind of turned into where when one of us would have a meeting, the other person would you know, take him for a walk, go to the park or something. And it was actually a wonderful time being able to spend you know, three or four months with him every day and get an idea of what life would be like just spending all of your time at home with your child because in our modern professional environments it's kind of you're lucky if work will give you a month or two off after your child is born and then you're expected to either stop working or to go back to work so our son was in daycare from a little over two months old so we would see him in the mornings and evenings and on the weekends but it wasn't that constant being with your child all the time so there were some feelings of kind of being a part-time parent mm -hmm. but having him home during the pandemic and getting to really experience what it is to be parenting 24 hours a day for one it gives you a massive amount of respect for stay-at-home parents and anyone who is uh, also a caregiver so anyone who works at the daycare and that is their profession that is I would not have the energy to last half a day working at a daycare. <laughs> I can barely handle one two-year-old, let alone, you know, four, five to ten of them. Right. But it was, uh, I've, I have found a lot of 
reward and joy in just going for a walk with him in a stroller and pointing at different birds and squirrels and going to the park and trying to name all the colors of the different cars and that it's it might seem simple or boring to some but i personally have found it really rewarding and fulfilling and i think that in a different uh, situation i would have no problem at all being as a stay-at-home dad yeah i think that sounds like so idyllic <laughs> But I know it's obviously very difficult as well. And you were in a very lucky situation where yes, very you know, much. both of you had that kind of work freedom during pandemic, which might not be everyone's case. But I'm glad you made the most of it. So coming back to the story, there are a few issues I picked on, like the mother wanting the boy to get married. Even though he wasn't independent, she was adamant about it. It's like an aspect of societal norm and pressure that you have to find a partner. Another aspect of societal pressure was from father. And even though it was rooted in probably giving his son an encouraging push, the task he gave him can be extrapolated to having unreasonable expectations from kids. And in the story, father was working, he was a merchant, and the mother was at home taking care of the boy and probably doing everything for him, which enabled him to be dependent on her to do everything and make decisions for him. And when he grew up, his father expected him to be taking his own decisions. I think that that is even something that was the, just, you know, the mother and father taking care of their kids to a almost complete extent was something that was maybe not necessarily pervasive, but at least common, even up through our generation where, you know, my, my parents made sure that I knew how to do my laundry and cook before I left for college, but, you mm -hmm. know, not a lot before I left for college. But I have, I have friends who have 10 year olds and 15 year olds and once a week they'll have the kids cook wow so it's it's definitely changing towards teaching these critical life skills at an earlier mm. age you know growing up i did learn a few skills but laundry was not one of them and uh when i moved away for the first time i had to youtube how to <laughs> operate the laundry machine um so so yeah so that was that but now i know how to do it and i do everything by myself so so that's good. <laughs> anyway, so we were talking about different duties which can be gendered, but obviously everyone's circumstances and situations are different. So something which is constant is the biology of mothers and fathers. There was a research done in the University of Exeter and University of Edinburgh, and they were checking the genetic link between the way a particular creature fathers versus the way it mothers. Their subject was the burning beetle which has very specific parenting roles based on their biological sex. They found that the male burring beetle is involved in much more indirect care of offspring, doing things like taking care of the nest and gathering food. The female burring beetle was much more likely to be involved in direct care of the offspring, doing activities that kept them in much closer contact, like feeding. Obviously, humans are a lot more complex than beetles, and to that add culture, society, and emotional quotient, how important is biology then? And if we talk about same-sex couples or single parents, then the biology doesn't work. But that doesn't mean there is anything wrong or missing in those parental setups. I mean, I definitely think that, at least in humans, I don't know if it's necessarily a, you know, sex-specific differences in nurturing behaviors, but I definitely think that some people are better at providing certain things for a child and other people are better at providing other things. And I think that often since people sort of seek out a complementary partner, that a pair of individuals who are together will hopefully be able to provide the full gamut of care activities for kids. So I guess you want one of them to, if you fall down, to scoop up the child and ask them where it hurts and give their skinned knee a kiss and all of these and possibly another parent to excel more at like planning out activities or doing more things like matching games or I guess you need uh, different skills between the two caretakers and as you brought up in things like a single parent household then you have one person who wears all the hats 
Mm -hmm. And with same-sex couples parenting, you know, there's absolutely no reason that a father and a father or a mother and a mother can't provide the full spectrum of parenting skills. Right. So I, I definitely think that we all excel more at different areas of being able to bring up an individual and mm -hmm. that often we end up in relationships with a complementary half. So, yeah, I think that uh, I don't know how much of it is defined genetically. I feel like a lot of it is defined culturally, definitely. But yeah, I don't know how much biology there is to it, but definitely cultural roles. Yes, so as long as the parent provides the support and love for their kid, things should work out just peachy. So wrapping this up, I think it was a good discussion and it was great to hear a father's perspective. And if you want to know what present Carl got, the first Father's Day present handmade by his two-year-old son, then go check out our Instagram post for this episode. It is uh, super <laughs> cute. <laughs> and I hope you have a belated celebration whenever uh, your wife comes back. Three of you can, you know, probably probably have Indian food. So. I would like that very much. <laughs> <laughs> right. Also, I do want to add that although we are talking about celebrating Father's Day, it can be a difficult day for some people. So my thoughts are with you. And again, a big shout out to all the amazing dads. And thank you, Carl, for coming on the show. That was great. Oh, thank you. On that note, bye for now. Bye. Bye-bye. Let me know your thoughts on the story and our discussion by emailing me on woketalespodcast at gmail.com or through social media at woketalespodcast on Instagram and woketalespod on Twitter. And please rate, review, and like Woke Tales Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe so you can easily access our weekly stories. If you have any story recommendations or if you want to come dissect and analyze a story with me, give me a shout out on email or social media. Because whatever you do, keep dissecting and keep analyzing.